What's up guys, it's Ivan and on this channel I provide tips, tricks, advice and strategies for your graduate school applications. So if you are new here, consider subscribing. In today's video, I wanted to share with you some of the ways that you can pay for graduate school through reviewing some of the institutional and program websites so that we can learn more about research assistantships teaching assistantships, readership positions, and fellowships. The first source of funding that I want to talk about is a research assistantship. This could um, be named differently at different institutions, but really what it is is someone who conducts research for a program, a faculty, or a research center. So we are going to look at the University of Texas Austin's website to learn, to learn a little bit more about what this um, position entails and how maybe you can attain one if you attend any graduate school program. So at the University of Texas Austin, what they call the position is graduate research assistant. I am currently a GSR at UC San Diego and what we call it is a graduate student researcher, but it's all the same thing. So as a GSR or a, a graduate student researcher, what you'll be doing is you will be contributing to a program or department or interdepartmental research under direction of faculty supervision. The work should directly relate to your professional training and course of study within the School of Architecture. So I'm obviously looking at the architecture website at the University of Texas Austin, but this is obviously um, going to happen for whatever field you're in. So I'm in the education field, so the project that I should be working on should be education focused and it should somewhat relate to what I want to do in the future. So right now I'm working on an assessment that um, supports really student retention and, and student completion of higher education, but whatever your field is, that's what you should be looking for in terms of a research assistantship. At the University of Texas Austin, what you'll do is you'll go on the website, whether it's depart departmental or sometimes it could be the graduate school division and they can tell you how to apply. Usually the application entails submitting a cover letter, a resume or CV, submitting may maybe some references, maybe a letter from your current advisor. Some of the requirements to be a graduate student researcher are the following. So you must uh, most of the time you have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, but also if you are an international student, there is there could be some positions for you, but you have to look more into it. So you want to make sure that you consult with your financial aid um, department, but also your program department to learn more about how international students can attain a position such as this. You also have to be a degree-seeking student, which means you have to be enrolled, obviously, in the program um, at the school. So most of the time you have to be full-time. Sometimes part-time students could also attain a research position as a graduate student, but most of the time you have to be full-time um, if you want to make if you want to attain a position like this. You also have to be in good standing. So most programs say you have a good standing means a 3.0 or higher. Um, and so you have to be in good standing in order for you to be able to attain a position in research. Sometimes the research position might ask for specific skill sets. So for example, if they conduct more quantitative work, then you want to make sure that you are well versed in quantitative methods. If their work is more qualitative, then you want to make sure that you highlight your qualitative skills. Finally, sometimes they might ask for specific field skill sets or knowledge. So for example, if they focus a lot of their projects on the framework such as critical race theory, and you don't know nothing about critical race theory, then it can be hard for you to get a position that you know works with that type of framework. So you wanna make sure you read the job description and you are well prepared to answer questions about certain terminology, certain theories, certain methodological approaches, whatever it is that that program, that research center is looking for, you wanna make sure you're able to speak about that with your experiences during the interview phase. Some of these positions do require interviews, some don't. So for example, my position that I currently have, I didn't even have to interview, I submitted an application, I think it was a brief CV and that's it. Um, and the reason why was because my advisor actually got me the position. Um, my advisor knew the program director of the program that I currently work for and she just passed on my name to that person um, and that person only asked me for my CV. And so they wanted to verify that I was able to conduct research, but also to be able to work within their field, which is retention work and um, graduation completion, things like that. And that's really what I'm interested in as well. So um, it worked perfectly well, but most um, research positions, you have to go through a formal process, which means that you have to either, you know, 
submit an application and then you interview and then you get accepted. Um, but sometimes it can be as easy as your professor knowing someone and putting a good word in for you. And then you submit some type of paperwork, so like a CV or something to showcase that you are well qualified for the, for the position. This obviously varies from program to program, from center to center, from institution to institution, whatever it is. So you wanna make sure you consult with your school, the program, whatever it is, to see what the process is like. Usually graduate student researchers, um, the position lasts a full academic year and then you can renew it depending on the program, depending on the funding, etc. cetera. Um, so you wanna make sure that you ask those questions during the interview phase or before you accept the position. Most um, positions do last a full year. So in my case, it's quarter system. So we mine would last three quarters and then you do not get hired on for the summer unless they have funding for summer. So you want to make sure you consult with the person that's in charge of that project or that program um, or whatever research project you're working on. That way you, you know what, um, what the dates are of employment. So if you are expected to work through the summer, then you want to make sure you know that. And if you don't have, if they don't have funding for you for the summer, then you also want to know that because then that, that way you're able to go somewhere else and search for funding or another position on campus. Usually research positions are 20 hours per week and usually graduate students are not allowed to um, work more than 20 hours per week, especially in the first two years of your program. So you are expected to work 20 hours per week on different things such as literature reviews, maybe you conduct some interviews or maybe you collect some data or maybe you analyze and code that data, um, whatever the program needs for you, or whatever the, the center needs from you that they're gonna tell you. Usually it entails something like, like that. So for example, um, I'm currently doing a whole assessment. So I have to do the um, collection of data, the interview protocol, I had to do the literature review, I had to um, propose the idea to my supervisor, etc. And so for my project in particular, I am highly involved in every aspect of the research process, whereas some centers might only ask you to conduct literature reviews. The pay for research positions varies um, depending on the program, depending on the project. So for example, my project right now, I get paid a little under $1,000 um for the month so every month i get paid like around i think it's like 850 or something something along those lines 850 um a month for 20 hours per week so that's what 80 hours for a whole month i only get paid like 850 a little under 900 dollars, i guess so like 850 860 per month but the cool thing about my program is that they guarantee us $21,000 of funding which means that if my salary between my graduate student position and my TA position don't come up to $21,000 within nine months, then they make up the difference. So they give me a stipend to make up the difference. So that, that's what they're doing right now. Right now I'm getting paid actually an extra couple hundred bucks from the program that I'm in to offset some of the costs that would prevent me from getting $21,000 for the nine months. And so you wanna make sure that you understand what the pay scale is and how much they're gonna be paying for you before you accept a position. Usually you wanna make sure that you are able to live off of what you're working, right? So you wanna make sure that you at least get a good stipend or salary that way you're able to afford your living expenses. And also if you do work 20 hours per week, you're also able to potentially get tuition remission, which means that you don't have to pay for tuition and the, the program or the institution um, pays for your tuition. And so for me, because I am working 20 hours per week within my two jobs, I'm able to get tuition remission, which means that I don't have to pay for tuition as part of my package for graduate school. The next source of funding that I want to talk about is a teaching assistantship or TA as most people know it. A TA position is probably the one of the most common ways that people that usually PhD students um, pay for the graduate school education. So a TA position usually is 20 hours per week and I'll talk a little bit more about the duties but it's 20 hours per week and because of that you get tuition remission which most people want right so you want you don't want to pay for tuition and you want a free PhD program and so most PhD students do pursue a TA position and with my program with my funding how it's structured we are required to be TAs usually in our second year and beyond so I have to be a TA right now I'm currently a TA I've been TAing since last year um, in the spring quarter so I've been a TA for the last three quarters and that's how I fund some of my graduate school education to learn a little bit more about TA positions we are going to look at UC Berkeley's website so we can learn more about the duties the pay scale etc so UC 
UC Berkeley describes their teaching assistantships as a half-time, 20 hours per week GSI appointment, typically entails responsibility for two discussions or three laboratory sections per week, holding office hours, preparing and grading of assignments and examinations, and other duties assigned by the faculty member in charge of the course. So usually for a TA position, you are working with the faculty member closely on a course that, the, that they teach. So you're supporting the faculty member with different things like, you know, teaching a section, or maybe you have to grade a lot of the assignments. Maybe you have to proctor examinations. Maybe you have to, um, what else, hold office hours. So you hold office hours like once per week or depending on how many sections you have, then you hold different office hours. And so you, your, your responsibility is to help and support the faculty member with the course that they are teaching or the courses they teach. So for example, right now I am TAing for one professor, one course, and for me, I'm only working 10 hours per week because I do have my other job, which is another 10 hours, but it still comes up to 20 hours per week. But because I only work 10 hours per week, I only have to lead one section. Luckily for this course, we don't have sections to lead because the course is pretty small. We have about 20 students for the course. And so all I have to do is hold office hours one hour per week, and then I have to grade all the assignments. We meet once a week to discuss just kind of the progression of the grades, how that's going, um, if there's any like thing, anything that students are not getting that, he, that she should cover in class. So we meet as an instructional team once per week for one hour and we discuss different aspects of the course, the grading, and how to proceed with the quarter or any red flags that we see within the students' work or whatever it is that I see when, when I'm grading or when I'm meeting with students. And so we do that once per week for one hour. So to apply for a TA position, it obviously going to vary from program to program, from, from school to school. So for example, in my funding package, they, they guaranteed us a TA position. So all I have to do is just apply because of policy, right? So they have to show documentation that I am qualified, et cetera, even though everybody gets a position. So for example, all I had to do was go on the website, this website that we get through an email, and I upload my CV, and then I, I answer a couple of questions, and that's it. I already have my position. I already know who I'm TAing for and which quarter, etc. Some programs funding structure isn't like that, so you have to actually apply. So for example, at UC Berkeley, they ask that you um, have minimum requirements to apply. So here they say that you must be registered and carry a minimum load of 12 units, having a GPA of at least a 3.1 and have no more than two incomplete grades and are making satisfactory progress toward your degree goal. So they do require some um, requirements, right, to be a TA. And then obviously they probably want you to be well versed in your field or the, the course that you plan to TA for. But the cool thing about um, being a TA and something that I did get a question recently from one of you um, in the comment section was, what if I don't know the content? What if I, you know, it's my first time being a TA, what if I don't know how to teach that well? The cool thing about being a TA is that there's a bunch of resources that you can access to learn how to be a better TA. So at UC Berkeley in particular, they actually make you take a new TA orientation course prior to you being a TA. They also require you to take a quarter long seminar that teaches you best practices to be a TA to diverse students. And then they also make you go to a teaching conference to continue to learn how to be a TA and possibly a professor if that's what you want to do after you graduate with your PhD. Um, they also have online courses that are, that are going to be able to support you throughout your TA position. So every institution does have some sort of training that you have to go through to be able to be a teacher assistant. A lot of this has to also do with ethics and, you know, things like um, how to what to do when a student plagiarizes or how to use Canvas or whatever or Blackboard, whatever system that your, your school uses. They teach you all that stuff through a course before, like an orientation course, before you assume your role as a TA. It seems like UC Berkeley is very focused on, you know, teaching well because they offer a lot of resources such as a teaching conference that's mandatory and then also a 300 level seminar course that's about teaching. For my current position, all I had to do was an online, a couple of modules online as an orientation and that's it. That's the only requirement that I had to do. So I wish that maybe they did provide an opportunity, a course such as this 300 level seminar that UC Berkeley does. That way we're able to hone our skills more as we progress as TAs. I do want to say though that 
here where I am at UC San Diego, they do offer a lot of teaching, you know, seminars that I could attend, but I choose not to just because I do have a lot of experience with being a teacher because that was my undergraduate degree. I student taught for a whole semester, etc. So I think I have a good grasp of what's a good, strong teacher assistant. But UC San Diego does offer a plethora of resources that you can tap into, but they're not required. You have to like seek them out. And usually we get these emails that let us know about these opportunities, but you have to seek them out and then obviously make time for them. So I don't want to say that we don't have that many resources because we do, but I personally choose not to pursue those because I think I have a good grasp of what it's like to be a good teacher assistant. All right, so how much do teacher assistants get paid? So I pulled up a couple of different um, amounts from different websites and you can find all this information guys on their websites just you know do a quick google search go on their search engines and you know look at the pay scales because it tells you and it's, and it's going to vary to depend on how much experience you have in terms of what year you're in etc but I, I chose to um, provide you with examples of the basics so um at uc berkeley as a ta on a monthly scale for 20 hours per week you get paid two thousand two hundred and fifty six dollars and ninety cents um at i think this is ucla you get paid two thousand five hundred eighty two dollars and ninety four cents and then at uc san diego you you get paid about two thousand two hundred and ninety five dollars and forty cents so as you can tell it varies by institution and by program um but you should expect to receive something around the 2200 mark which is pretty standard for most TA positions and really funding for graduate school at most public institutions that are not Ivy League. I feel like the Ivy League um, provides more funding than do other public institutions, but you can look at these pay scales on their websites. I pulled these numbers from the websites, the pay scales, and it tells you um, it tells you what you should expect to receive on a monthly basis. If you want me to make a video on how to you know, find and read pay scales for graduate students, let me know in the comments down below. All right, so let's move on to readership positions. We're going to look at UCLA's website to determine what that is. So they call them special readers. Special readers are advanced graduate students who assist faculty members with the reading and grading of students' papers and exams under the guidance and direction of faculty members. Special readers must, must have taken and received at least a B plus in the course for which they are reading. So special readers or readers or readerships whatever you want to call it really what they do is solely focused on the grading of exams papers whatever the course entails and that's your job your job is just to support with the grading because some of these courses do have hundreds of students right usually um going to be taing for a course the that is like a introductory broad course for undergrads maybe first year second years and those um and those courses have a lot of students so you're supporting with the grading and that's all you do you don't have to hold office hours you don't have to um, teach a section you don't have to do anything else but grade as a first year phd student last year that was my position all i had to do was grade and help with the grading and my my role was a re readership right so i got paid to grade exams essays quick writes um, weekly assignments whatever it is that was my job and it was pretty chill because all you do is grade, right? And obviously grading does get tedious and it does get difficult because so much grading, but it's not high stakes where you have to like teach students about content. You don't have to know content prior to grading. Um, it is helpful if you attend the lectures or if you read the material. So for example, my position as a reader, we had to attend the lectures and we, so that we learn what they were learning that week, right? What the topic was for that week and that we're able to um, grade the essays and provide feedback as best as possible with the knowledge that we gain from the lectures. So obviously as a reader, your whole role is to grade assignments and examinations. And that means that you are gonna get paid the least amount of money from all the, these sources of income that I'm talking about because you are you have low stakes in terms of what you're providing, right? You're, you're, you're only grading. So you're not gonna have to hold the section. You're not gonna have to know knowledge. You're not gonna have to, um, what's it called? hold office hours and et cetera. And so because of that, usually readership positions pay them the least. And that usually ranges from 15 to $20 per hour. And usually you work 10 hours or 20 hours per week for a quarter or semester. So you get paid the least. So you wanna know that in advance, if you end up taking a readership position um, that you don't get paid that much money. But like I mentioned before, my program's funding structure allows 
us to you know have some flexibility so for example i had to be a reader in my whole first year but i was still making twenty one thousand dollars for the year because of my funding structure a lot of funding structures are not like that so you want to make sure you you know know what your funding structure looks like and if, if taking a, a readership position is going to be something that's going to be ideal for you or not. Obviously, if you want to make more money, you want to be either a TA or a researcher and ex instead of being a reader. All right, guys. So the last way that you should pay for your graduate school education is through fellowships. So a fellowship is a great opportunity for you to obviously gain some money for your tuition and, your, and a living stipend but it gives you autonomy to do whatever you want with your career or with those years that you are getting funding so usually fellowships last from one to three years um, and they are for different stages of your career some of them are for like when you're early on in your first second year some of them are for like dissertation um, proposals etc or postdoctorates whatever it is but these fellowships provide you with a substantial amount of stipend so usually they're probably the most um, out of all the funding sources I've talked about so far but they allow you to work on projects that you are passionate about so the research that you want to conduct in your field in your um, research interests usually when you are a graduate student researcher you have to work on someone else's projects for their um, career right so you're just gaining experience with research but with the fellowship you're able to do whatever you want in terms of your research studies so these are these are so this is a great opportunity for you to learn about um, a certain topic or maybe you want to explore something new but it allows you the freedom to do whatever you want with your academic career for the the years that you are funded through a fellowship so to learn more about fellowships we're going to look at two websites we're going to look at the harvard graduate school of education so you can learn a little bit more about what master's fellowships look like and then we're going to go um, look at university of california san diego's website to learn about external funding for fellowships because fellowships could be internal which means that they're institutional or they could be external which means they are funded by other organizations so let's look at the harvard graduate school of education and i'm going to link these links down below in the, in the description box but um for hgsc they have a multitude of fellowships so they have the urban scholars fellowship they have this one called the saul saints fellowship they have the sacrament fellowship the forsheimer fellowships and um, under these fellowship descriptions they also provide you with information on how to apply and how much uh, money you are going to receive so for example the urban scholars fellowship is specifically for people who have provided evidence demonstrating their strong commitment to the betterment of urban education and so they describe a little bit more about how to apply and um and how do you go about obviously applying and qualifying and so you must have submitted a financial aid application for this um, to be eligible for this fellowship as well as a, an application to HGSC admission so it looks like your application for the Harvard Graduate School of Education is also your application for the Urban Scholars um, Fellowship as well if we look at the leadership and education found fellowships through HGSC they want someone who is a strong who, who shows they want to fund people who show promise as strong leadership potential and demonstrate financial need as determined by HGSC's financial aid office. And so you have to um, obviously apply for, apply for financial aid to show financial need. And then you also have to apply for admission to HGSC and obviously gain admission. So it looks like a lot of these Harvard Graduate School of Education fellowships um, are determined by the application you submit, but also by completing a financial aid application. Um, so you can go on this website to determine like kind of what the fellowship entails and it also tells you that some of them are will pay either full or partial tuition and they also provide you with other professional development opportunities as well as you know travel funding so if we look at the university of california san diego's website here and they their title is graduate fellowship initiative we see a list of fellowships with amounts so um, these are external fellowships which means which means that the university of california san diego does not provide this funding instead they're directing you to other websites that will determine how to apply and how much funding they're going to give you from other organizations so for example the american association of university women dissertation fellowship for that one if you get it 
you get $20,000 stipend. And I do want to emphasize that this does say dissertation fellowship, which means that you have to be either going into your dissertation phase of your PhD or already in it. And so you want to make sure you click on the link and you determine if you're eligible um, and you get $20,000 stipend. There's a couple of other ones such as the American Scandinavian Foundation, which amounts vary. They also have one for the American Soci Sociological Association for doctoral dissertation again. Um, that one's $16,000 award. They have one for the Autism Science Foundation Fellowship, which is $25,000 stipend, and etc. So you can go through this website here and see if you qualify for any of these fellowships. And I, um, and I advise that you do apply for fellowships first and apply to as many as you can because again, if you receive one of these fellowships, you do not have to TA, you don't have to conduct research that is not yours. If you get one of these fellowships, your focus is solely on your academic trajectory. So whatever you want to conduct, whatever projects you want to do, this fellowship allows you to do that instead of having to work on someone else's projects or spending a lot of your time as a TA, as a reader, as a researcher, whatever your job entails, this fellowship will provide you with tuition remission as well as a living stipend. With the fellowship, they don't ask much of you besides obviously getting good grades, maybe attending a conference that they throw, or maybe um, you know submitting a progress report of some sort, right? But the purpose of fellowships is to advance your career in your field and give you the autonomy to do that with whatever projects you want to work on. All right, so that concludes my video on how to fund your graduate school education. Let me know if you have any questions down below in the comments and I will get to those as soon as I can. Thank you for watching this video and I will see you in the next video.